Good evening. Welcome to our Sunday evening service, this second Sunday in January 2021. I hope uh, the new year is going well for you, even despite the present lockdown conditions we are under again. As part of our church risk assessment, uh, we decided that it would be perhaps good to reduce the number of in-person services in the church building to just one on a Sunday for the moment, just to help reduce the risk of the transmission of the virus. And so for uh, the next few Sundays, uh, this Sunday evening service will just be online. Do tune in 6.30 each Sunday evening and be together in fellowship together. Do uh, sign in on the live chat. Let us know you're here and we can be connected together. Uh, let me give you some good news this week. On the Feast of the Epiphany, the 6th of January, uh, the 12th day of Christmas, John and Epi and Susanna were blessed with a baby boy, Jacob Alexander Emmanuel Thompson. Jacob, if you're listening, uh, welcome, welcome to our world. Welcome to the Thompson family, but welcome also to this, your church family. We look forward to welcoming you as soon as we can to church. Uh, God bless you, John and Epi and Susanna, in this great addition to your family. God bless uh, Jacob. We rejoice with you at God's goodness. A short time back, uh, Epi recorded for us uh, a couple of songs which we're going to hear. Epi's going to lead us in worship of these two songs. Then we shall come to our Bible reading and reflections. So let's begin with some praise and worship uh, from the mother we are congratulating today. Uh, Epi, lead us if you would.
Thank you, Epi and Grace. Uh, so now we're going to the Bible. Uh, if you have a Bible, let's turn to the Gospel of Mark, uh, chapter 1, and we're going to begin at verse 4. Just Mark, chapter 1, verse 4 to 11. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and he was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open, and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Well, this evening I want to uh, pick up really from where we left off last week. Uh, if you were here last week or tuned in uh, to the YouTube uh, uploading of Josephine's sermon, she gave us a New Year's message reflecting on the epiphany, uh, the worship of the wise men, the revelation of Jesus uh, to the wider world outside of Israel. And uh, Josephine touched on epiphany, and she gave us uh, some great themes to think about. She talked about uh, wonder and gratitude, uh, unity and reconciliation, and then celebration and affirmation. And although she was focused on the epiphany, she touched on the other Bible readings which are set in the Church of England lectionary, that is the calendar of readings for this time of the year. Those who designed the Church of England readings for January, for the start of a new year, moved from Epiphany to the continuing ways in which Jesus was revealed, who he was, his authority, his work, what he came to do, who he was. And uh, the readings which uh, follow on in the church calendar, the lectionary, are really uh, the baptism of Jesus and then the story of Jesus turning water into wine. And Josephine introduced us to those uh, two other stories. And I want tonight to focus on the baptism of Jesus, as we've just read from Mark chapter 1, and then next week look at water into wine. Uh, John, who tells that story, if you want to get ahead, it's at the start of John chapter 2. Uh, at the end of it, John says, this was the first sign, the first miracle that Jesus did, which tells us something about who he was and what he was about. But tonight we focus on the baptism of Jesus. And it's a fascinating incident because uh, baptism is introduced to us in uh, Mark's Gospel uh, in a slightly unusual way. Uh, we hear about this eccentric character, John, John the Baptizer, uh, not operating in the mainstream, uh, not in the temple, not in the normal religious uh, orbits, but uh, out in the wilderness. And yet people were flocking to him, and they were being baptized. They were going into water and coming out again as new people. And it was a sign. It was a picture of God's new life. And Mark says it was a baptism for repentance. They confessed their sins, and they found forgiveness. It was a baptism of repentance. Uh, the Greek word is metanoias, a change about, complete change about. That's what they were looking for. And they found baptism as a sign that they were indeed forgiven. And we need to understand how uh, radical, revolutionary this was. We tend to think of baptism uh, within a church as part of the religious practices of our church. But at the time, the way in which you might feel you could get right with God was really the work of the priesthood and sacrifice at the altar. It was something at the temple. Here is John the baptizer radically operating out in the wilderness, and yet people were flocking to him. And so we can get our head around the idea that uh, baptism was about forgiveness uh, and about confession of sin. And then Jesus comes from Nazareth and uh, presents himself to John 
and is baptized. And the obvious question we want to ask is, if baptism is about forgiveness of sin, confession of sin, finding forgiveness, why does Jesus, the sinless Son of God, the Savior of the world, need to undergo baptism? Surely that's for us sinful men and women. But for the sinless Son of God, why should Jesus be baptized? What was it all about? What do we see? What do we learn from this? Well, when I look at the baptism of Jesus, I would like to summarize uh, five uh, long words. And if you don't like the long words, I'm going to give you five alternative short words. Uh, so let's start with the, uh, the long words. I believe the baptism of Jesus is about the incarnation, uh, God becoming man. It's about identification. Jesus, the sinless son of God, identifying with sinful men and women. It's an initiation. That is, it's the start. It's the launch pad of his ministry. Uh, as well as identification and initiation, it's also his identity. The voice from heaven says, this is my son. The voice of God says, this is my son. And then the very end of it, uh, I would say there is some sense of intimacy. This is my son whom I love. So the five long words, incarnation, identification, initiation, identity, and intimacy. And if you're not a fan of uh, longer words, uh, let me simply summarize it like this. The baptism of Jesus says that God, who Jesus is, with us, like us, for us, over us, and into us. Uh, so take your pick. Uh, five nouns or five uh, prepositions. Uh, let's just run through those uh, one by one. The incarnation. This is uh, the great truth we celebrate at Christmas. God, the creator of the world, becoming a human being. That's what the carols, what's what our Bible readings celebrate at Christmas. In the beginning, the word, the extraordinary uh, creator, God, who was always there, the word became flesh, dwelt among us, moves in with his creatures, with those he's created, uh, becomes one of us. And uh, the story of the baptism of Jesus comes probably some 30 years later from where we left off the story with the epiphany. Uh, here is Jesus as a man. We've only had one story in the Bible about the childhood of Jesus, uh, that time when he was lost in the temple. Uh, we fast forward to his adult ministry, and here he comes on the scene, and he says, I have come uh, to be with you. And I've come to be like you. In some ways, he's not like us. In other ways, he has become like us. And Jesus uh, is not only the incarnate son of God, the one who's come to be with us, but he's come to be like us in terms of taking on human temptation, human suffering, the human experience. And the ultimate work for which Jesus uh, came to earth was to give his life on the cross, to bring about that forgiveness which John preaches through his death on the cross. It's on the cross that Jesus identifies with sinful men and women. He became what he was not so that we could become what we were not. He becomes sin for us so that we can become acceptable to God. Jesus like us. I think probably that's my strongest understanding of the baptism of Jesus, the, uh, this word identification. He identifies with us. He became sin. He who knew no sin, the Bible says, became sin for us. And it begins right at the start of his adult ministry. He says, let me show that I am going to become like the people I've come to save. Not that I shall become sinful, but I identify with their sin. I will take that on, just as ultimately I will take that on on the cross. And yet there's also a sense of it, this baptism being a launch pad, commissioning of a new ministry. Sometimes we do that in the church when there's a new minister. We have a service of induction, um, institution. And this is, if you like, the commissioning, the initiation, the induction, the institution of Jesus, the one who will now begin an itinerant ministry, traveling, healing, teaching, driving out demons, and then ultimately heading for the work of the cross. This is the launch pad. This is the initiation. And it's as though uh, John the Baptist, uh, in baptizing him, is not only saying you are the representative of sinful men and women, 
but this is uh, launching you into that mission. When we baptize people, uh, there's a sense that we are also commissioning them. It's not just about forgiveness. In adult baptism particularly, there are, and in confirmation, there are normally some questions and answers about commissioning. Will you accept this task, not just to know that you're saved and forgiven by God, but will you work to tell others the good news by your words and by your action? Baptism, the launch pad for mission, the initiation into the mission which Jesus came to do. He's uh, come to be with us. He's come to be like us. And that mission is for us. This is John the Baptist saying uh, this is the start of what you will do uh, for those you've come to show your love to. And then the baptism itself uh, has some similarity with the baptism of all the other people who've come to John for baptism. There's uh, the water, there's the going down, there's the coming up, there's the symbol of forgiveness. But there were some unique things about the baptism of Jesus, uh, two particular things we read. One is, uh, or maybe three, uh, one is that as he comes out of the water, the spirit comes down. The heavens open and there's a voice from heaven. So really three, the spirit coming down, the heavens opening and the voice from heaven. And those things are unique. And it's a lovely picture of what we call the Trinity. Uh, the three parts of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, working together, uh, visibly being seen or heard together. And uh, before I say much more about that, just uh, maybe think back to how the Bible begins in the book of Genesis, uh, how the work of creation is explained. It's about uh, the heavens opening, God acting, the Spirit moving over the waters, and uh, the voice of God. And God says, let there be light. Let there be uh, all the different aspects of creation. The voice of God speaks into being the world with the work of the Spirit hovering over the waters. And we see something similar, don't we, in this baptism. There's the water, there's the Spirit, there's the voice of God. The new creation is being brought into being in a parallel of the original creation of the world at the very beginning of the Bible at the very beginning of, of time. God speaks and it happens. Now what does God say in this particular incident? He says, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. The words which God the Father speaks to Jesus uh, speak of his true identity. You are my son, the son of God, son of the creator of the world. With me, as part of the Godhead. With you, I am well pleased. There is a love connection. There's a relationship. There is an intimacy. Those are our fourth and fifth eyes. Uh, identity, the identity of Jesus, and the intimacy of God's love. The intimacy of the whole Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So uh, God has come to be with us in Jesus. God has come to identify with us, to be like us to a certain degree, to experience all that we go through, to become sin even for us. He is initiated uh, to begin the mission on our behalf for us. And then there's that sense that we remember that he is actually God, the Son of God, over us. But intimacy, we are called to enter into that relationship that the Father and the Son enjoy together. Jesus says in John's Gospel, I and my Father are one, are one, and you are one in me. You in me and I in the Father. We are invited into that relationship of intimacy, of love. Yes, to recognize God as the authority over us. Yes, to recognize Jesus as, as almost like a brother who's come to be alongside us. But actually we're invited into a sense of intimacy, a relationship where we are able to hear God say to us, uh, you are my son whom I love. If you're a parent, uh, I wonder how many times you absolutely expressly with words say to your son or daughter, you are my son whom I love. I love you. With you, I am well pleased. Uh, but there's something, there's something deeply affirming by knowing that we are loved by our parents, uh, that we are 
fully accepted, fully known, and that there is a place where we belong. So what does the baptism of uh, Jesus say to us uh, in the beginning of 2021 in this current context of anxiety, uncertainty through the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic? Well, maybe we can think of some of those words and see how we as a church come Jesus to the world. We are the body of Christ. So what does it mean to be a church which uh, takes seriously a sense of incarnation? We often say uh, that the Bible tells us not to be of the world, but yet uh, we are to take on the lives of our neighbours, to uh, share in all that they're going through, uh, not to be removed or exempt uh, from the hardships and challenges of life, from some of the big questions, some of the big issues and challenges, but to enter in uh, into people's lives, to understand uh, their situations, their challenges to come alongside, uh, just as Jesus took on human flesh. So we uh, can, in a sense, come into the lives of those around us. These last uh, few months where uh, we've been less able to gather together, I've uh, sometimes found myself uh, on the steps of the church. In fact, we have morning prayer on the steps of the church. But I spent uh, time loitering, if you like, uh, waiting for people uh, to meet outside rather than inside the building. And it's brought me into far more contact with some of the people who equally loiter for other reasons on the steps. It's a place where sometimes people have met uh, to engage in drug use or to purchase drugs as a good landmark. Meet me by the church. It's a place where uh, a number of street drinkers have decided is a good location to, to sit and drink. And it's been fascinating for me to of being able to spend a bit more time just chatting, talking, coming alongside and hearing uh, the stories of how people have got themselves into uh, cycles of self-destruction to, uh, to a large degree, just to come alongside to share some of their stories. Obviously, I haven't entered into uh, their lives completely. I haven't taken on uh, their, their practices or their habits. Uh, I haven't slept on the steps of the church, as a number of homeless people have done. But there's, in a very small way, a sense of simply sitting, uh, coming alongside uh, people and understanding a bit more firsthand uh, about the things which they are going through. How can we as a church come alongside our neighbours? How can we sit and listen? How can we give people the dignity uh, to be able to tell their stories and to accept them as they are? How can we identify with the poor, the marginalized, those who are struggling, those perhaps for whom uh, they don't, perhaps for those who feel they don't have a voice, uh, they don't have any access uh, to power. How can we identify with them? How can we continue uh, to show God's love for the poor, the vulnerable? Initiation, uh, I guess a good question for the new year. Uh, I agree with Josephine, it's not quite new year, new, new me, new you. Actually, sometimes it's good to think, what is God leading me into? What is the next step for me in my calling, in my mission? Is it to do something different or is it to carry on, but to do something in a different way? What involvement is God calling me to in the church, even with all the limitations of church life at the moment? What is God's calling? What is there that God would have me launch out into, just as Jesus launched out into mission uh, from his baptism? What am I commissioned to do? What are my new opportunities? Uh, what are the new uh, routes available for me to serve God and to build his kingdom? And then uh, what about identity? What is our identity? Well, uh, the Bible teaches us to understand ourselves as children of God. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says, See what manner the... The love, see what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. How much does God love us? Who can hear him say, you are my son, you are my daughter, whom I love. That we have been adopted. Jesus was God's natural uh, son, if you like. We are the adopted children of God. That's our identity. We have God as our Father. It is only uh, the Christian understanding of God which says we can call God our Father. There are other religions who 
have an understanding of God's authority, the need to obey God, the need to submit to God. But many other religions, in fact, I think all other religions, would stop short of saying that we can have that sort of father-son, uh, father-child relationship with God. But it's a unique thing. Jesus said, when you pray, don't start off necessarily by saying, Almighty God, creator of the world, holiest of holy, king of kings. Yes, we can use those titles. But Jesus said, when you pray, say, our Father. Our identity in Christ is that we are children of God. We have God as our Heavenly Father. And then that leads us to, uh, again, to that encouragement to know of an intimacy with God, uh, to, to know how much God loves us. Uh, Paul prays for the Christians in the church in Ephesus uh, at the end of Ephesians chapter 3. He says, my prayer for you is that you would know how much you're, you're loved, how much uh, God's love is so good for you, how great and wide and large and high and, and broad it is, that you would know how much you are loved. And uh, that's a great prayer uh, for ourselves and for one another. Lord, teach us to understand how much you love us, how much you care for us, uh, your extraordinary love, which took Jesus to the cross, but uh, that ongoing love and care. It's a message the world uh, needs to hear at this time of anxiety and uncertainty and fear and of unknown plans which uh, we're not sure can be made, um, things we want to do, places we want to go, which are closed to us at the moment. We need to know that uh, through it all, God's love is secure and is strong. God is into us. Uh, he loves us. Extraordinary that it is. Uh, but he's chosen uh, to put his love uh, on us. Um, it's something that's hard to conceive, but it's the hope which can keep us going. The fact that we know that we are loved by God and that he's called us to know him and to make him known. And so let us pray the special prayer, the collect for this Sunday, the baptism of Christ. Let us pray. Eternal Father, who at the baptism of Jesus revealed him to be your son, anointing him with the Holy Spirit, grant to us who are born again by water and the Spirit that we may be faithful to our calling as your adopted children. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let's continue just to pray for our community and for our nation. Heavenly Father, we come before you and pray for your mercy in the midst of this COVID pandemic. Be close, Lord God, to all those families who are bereaved at the moment. For those who are caring, for those who are sick. For those members of our church who work in the health service, doctors, nurses, administrators. Pray, Lord God, that you would enable them to have perseverance and resilience, physical and emotional strength in the work they've called, they're called to do. Pray, Lord God, for the work of the vaccination teams, for the sense of hope that uh, the vaccination program might be able to give us to return to some of the normal ways in which we enjoy living our lives. Lord, in the darkness of the world around us at the moment, may we, your people, be able to bring light and life and hope. The good news that we can call God Father, the good news that we have a God who loves us, that wants us to know his forgiveness, his purpose, and eternal companionship with him. Lord, strengthen us for the particular challenges and opportunities that each one of us has this week. Pray particularly for children and young people who are currently not able to go to school. Be with those who are teaching online. Be with those who are actually teaching in person, those children who are in schools. But be in every home. Let there be peace, a lifting of tension, a joy and confidence in one another. And we pray most of all for a joy and confidence in the knowledge of your love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Thank you very much for joining me this evening. Thank you for those who've uh, put greetings and words on the live chat. Let me just tell you about a couple of things we're doing as a church uh, this week and in the weeks to come. Uh, our intention, our hope, our plan, uh, things change, as you know, from uh, week to week, is that uh, Sunday services will continue to uh, continue to be in person as well as live streamed with all the COVID secure measures that we have uh, implemented. Uh, but we will also be introducing a midweek service Wednesday. Uh, the doors will open at 12. The idea is that there will be an opportunity for those who would like to uh, be silent for half an hour, just to come in for silent prayer. Then at 12.30, a short Holy Communion service. We thought that actually Holy Communion might be appreciated uh, midweek by those who would appreciate a smaller gathering. Uh, it may well suit people who are working from home or even uh, homeschooling from home just to get a little break midweek to come out to church for half an hour, peace and silence in prayer, followed by communion at 12.30. Obviously, you're free just to come at 12.30 if you want uh, for the communion, uh, which will probably finish about one o'clock. It's been our program in Lent. Uh, to have a Wednesday communion. In a way, we're just starting a bit earlier. And also on our YouTube channel, we are going to have a moment of daily prayer at 12 noon each day. Uh, the idea is this. Uh, we would love people to stop what they're doing at 12. Uh, that may not be possible for everybody, depending on your schedule or work or family commitments. But if you're able to stop, put on our YouTube channel at 12, and there will be simply a short Bible reading from Mark's Gospel, a prayer, and then an invitation to join together in the Lord's Prayer. Obviously, it will be available after the 12 o'clock uh, when it comes on, but we just thought there might be something uh, valuable in feeling connected one to another if as many people as possible could stop at 12 o'clock, just five, six minutes. Um, and we're going to do this Monday, starting tomorrow, uh, through to Saturday uh, for the next few weeks. Uh, so join us Monday to Saturday, 12 o'clock online, or Wednesday, 12 o'clock in church, followed by 12.30, Holy Communion. Uh, for the next few Sundays, uh, this Sunday evening service will continue to be an online service only. Uh, so don't turn up at the church on a Sunday at 6.30, but do join us again. Uh, God bless you, and greetings wherever you are. We're going to finish with a lovely song by Stuart Townsend. Uh, there is a hope that burns within my heart. It gives me strength for every passing day. A glimpse of glory now revealed in meagre part, yet drives all doubt away. I stand in Christ with sins forgiven, and Christ in me, the hope of heaven, my highest calling and my deepest joy, to make his will my home. Epi's going to sing this song for us as we conclude, as we go into this week, trusting in that sure hope uh, that God alone can give us, and which by his grace we can pass on to the world around us.
Thank you.